Buonasera, buonasera a tutti, benvenuti, benvenuta a Lisa Nishimura, eh, io faccio un'introduzione in italiano, poi le farò le, le domande in inglese così che non dovete mettere e togliere le, le, le cuffie. Lisa è vicepresidente, eh, come vedete da quello che c'è scritto lì, dei documentari eh, a Netflix. Lei lavora a Netflix da dieci anni e stasera ragioneremo con lei su quanto siano oggi i documentari una forma di, di giornalismo, su quanto stiano cambiando il giornalismo e sul perché siano diventati così importanti dentro, dentro Netflix. Tra l'altro uno di quelli che vedete qui nell'immagine, White Helmets, ha vinto l'Oscar per, per i documentari corti, un documentario di 40 minuti, ha vinto l'Oscar quest'anno, che, che parla di, questi, di questo gruppo di, di volontari, questa milizia di volontari che fa soccorso in Siria ad Aleppo ai, ai feriti. E, um, do you speak Italian, of course? No? <laughs> Bene, lei è venuta qui stasera, è arrivata ieri sera da Los Angeles e riparte domani mattina per la California. Quindi è qui per questo incontro, mi sembra una bella, una bella occasione. Le diamo il benvenuto. Welcome. Vediamo una breve scheda di Netflix sull'inventory sul, di quest'anno. What's important is the story, the message, the feeling, the connection. Obviously, there was a scientific side to our journey, but what we were really chasing was a magical side. I don't think she sees it as a competition. She's here to express her inner being. فمن أحياها فكأنما أحيا الناس جميعا. All I have to do is tell the truth. Do you know who killed John Bonet? If you tell someone a secret, it's no longer a secret. The feelings they have go far and beyond our understanding. Traders in ivory actually want extinction of elephants. The less elephants there are, the more the price rises. And it's a race against time. We can't ignore that porn today is sex education. We had an enormous story to tell. The greatest heroes, the greatest villains on the world stage. These documentaries changed the world. The truth always comes out. Tra l'altro siamo a Perugia dove hanno girato Amanda, che è il primo dei documentari italiani di, di Netflix. Hi Lisa and welcome. Hi. Could you Thank you for having me. Good evening. Could you explain us what's your role in Netflix first of all? Sure. So I oversee the original documentary initiative. Uh, so uh, I've been with the company now 10 years, but uh, in 2013 We launched what we call the original documentary programming. So that's where we are producing our own documentaries and releasing them uh, exclusively on Netflix to 190 countries around the world simultaneously. When you joined Netflix 10 years ago, uh, it was a DVD rental entity. No? <laughs> yes. That's yes. it. Yes. And, and can, can you explain us uh, what's changed? in these 10 years, and, wh and, and why you choose to join them 10 years ago? Right, um, so yes, in, when I joined 10 years ago, we were only in the United States. Uh, it was DVD by mail, uh, and we were only distributing content that other people created, so it was a vastly different company. Uh, but when I did my interview, I was in New York at the time, and I was working for Chris Blackwell, uh, who started Island Records and Films. Uh, he had an independent company called Palm Pictures that I worked at producing music and film for him for about uh, 10, 11 years. Um, 
so at the time when I had my interview with Ted Sarandos and Reed Hastings, despite the fact that that's what the company was, a DVD company in the United States, we spoke mostly about the ambition and the aspiration of what the real goal of the company was, which was to begin streaming and delivering um, television and film through the internet for the world. Uh, so the excitement was certainly at the opportunity provided with the job as it currently stood, which at the time my role was to um, buy DVDs from around the world. So in some ways it was the first global job. I bought all the independent film. So anything that a major studio didn't create, my team purchased, which was wonderful. That meant we bought all of the documentaries, all the foreign films, all the independent films, all of the stand-up comedy, all the genres of content that I think Netflix became known for, you know, specialty content like Japanese anime as an example. And we found that when we bought content from around the world that was high quality, people loved it. They absolutely consumed it. So the job that I entered was very exciting, but the aspiration of what it was going to become was really thrilling. To, to, the, the aspiration was to produce something original. That, that's the one part. So I will say that there's been three major evolutions. Yeah. A lot of change every day at Netflix, but three major evolutions I can speak to. So again, when I joined, it was DVD in the US. The next evolution was launching the streaming service, right, over the internet delivery. The next evolution was to go from being a domestic only company to being international. I still remember when it was a big decision to go into Canada. <laughs> it seemed like a big step. Um, and you know, today we're now 190 countries. And then the third evolution was to go from being pure distribution for other people's content to becoming our own studio and producing our own content. So three major changes in a decade. Okay, let's talk about the documentary. And when, when, you, when you discovered that audiences had a, a hunger for documentaries, not always reflected at the box office. Right, right. So, you know, what you're mentioning is where we saw opportunity, right? So when we think about Netflix, we are 100% consumer oriented. That's what we're thinking about all the time is just how do we delight all of our members around the world. And so when we can come up with a solution that we think that will bring them joy, we're going to try it. So on the original series side, an example of that was when we released um, you know, House of Cards or Orange is the New Black. We released all the episodes at once, and we gave consumers control over how they wanted to watch, when they wanted to watch, what device they wanted to watch it on, and they absolutely love that idea of control and access, right, is a really, really big question when it comes to documentaries. So because of my background buying the documentaries on DVD for so many years, I understood that when you made great nonfiction storytelling available, people really engaged with it. So. What we found was in documentary, the distribution model is very fragmented. It's very disaggregated. So what often will happen, you know, there are cases when a documentary will release in a film festival and then never release anywhere in the world, right? So you read these beautiful reviews and you don't get to watch it. Or sometimes it will release in the theater but only for a weekend. Or it will release in the United States but never internationally. Or the windows that are delayed by months to years, right? So. We thought, okay, we have access into 190 countries. If we were to create a model where we were going to make documentaries available simultaneously, because that's a very, very powerful thing to do, is to ignite a global conversation and allow a storyteller, allow a filmmaker to really connect with an audience around the world with a message. Because now everybody's communicating you know, on their phone, on social media. So you can watch something talk about it online, and then anybody that's interested in it can also very easily access that same story. So it changes the complexion of potential impact so significantly. And the model you're talking about with theatrical, you know, we found that my feeling always was when you looked at the opening weekend numbers of box office for a documentary, I never felt that that was a fair reflection of what the real demand was. But the problem is the model, whether it's broadcast television trying to do ratings or theatrical trying to get box office numbers for the weekend, if they're not strong enough, the film gets pulled right out of theaters. So 
let's just say you read a great review about a documentary on Monday and you say, oh, I'm gonna go to the theaters on Friday. And then you have a really hard week at work. You're tired, so on Friday you wanna go see a comedy, right? But that doesn't mean you don't wanna see the documentary, you just didn't wanna go that Friday night. But then when you go back, it's gone, right? And that's not a fair reflection. So we said, if we made it available, not just Friday, not just the following week, but every day, 24 hours a day, and if we married that with our algorithm, right, that presents content to you personalized. So everybody in here, if you're on Netflix, you have a very different homepage than everybody else because it's based on what you like. And so all of a sudden, we had an opportunity to present works of nonfiction on equal ground with scripted. So you will often see, you know, my page is big scripted series, but then right next to it is a documentary, maybe a documentary series, and then maybe a comedy. And so you democratize the ability for people to engage with content in a really significant way. And again, you make the content available over time at your will, and the engagement levels are so high because of that. When you started with the documentaries, when you started to, to produce original documentaries, so at Netflix, I started producing original documentaries at the very end of 2013. So it's just getting started. We're still very new. Four years ago. Four years ago. Yeah. And, and how do you measure the success of the documentaries? So we think about it in a couple of different ways. So first and foremost, the goal is always to make what we will think is the very, very best documentary programming for different groups of our viewers. Right, so some people, because inside documentary, there's so many genres, right? There's social issues, political issues, environmental, there's cooking, there's music, there's art, there's culture. So inside each of these different categories, our goal is always to make the most elevated, most exciting yeah. type of documentary content. Uh, so we think about it from a, a number of different things. We think about it certainly from engagement, so we obviously know the audiences and who's watching, but we also think about it from, you know, critical reviews, is it something that's being really uh, embraced and appreciated by the critics, the journalists, etc. cetera. Um, you know, we also look at um, awards. You know, I, I think it's incredibly important for our filmmaker partners to feel like they're gaining recognition from their peers, and so that becomes a priority for us as well. Um, but it's really about ensuring that we provide a diversity of voices. Right, that's increasingly important. So we are, today we have um, 93.8 million members around the world. And each one of those members probably has multiple profiles, right? So mm -hmm. you think, you know, a couple hundred million impressions yeah. uh, through the service. So increasingly we have to think about how do we delight that increasingly diverse audience? Right? This year, we'll have more international subscribers than domestic by the end of the year, is the prediction. So we have to think about who gets to tell the story. Right? And so for me, what's exciting, because as a Japanese woman, I want to embrace different stories. I want female filmmakers. I want international filmmakers. I want uh, filmmakers from all different types of backgrounds who can tell their story authentically. And so that's what's really important. And that, in that way, all the stories resonate with their specific audiences. Do you have an idea of, of the percentage of your subscribers that, that, um, that, that loves uh, documentaries? Yes, yeah, so um, we actually looked at it. So in 2016, around 73% of our entire membership watched a documentary, which is an enormous number when you think about some of the statistics you read about theatrical and this and that. So we've been able to sort of prove our theory about saying the best documentary storytelling, if you make it available, people will watch. And, and what is the, the, the issue, the category with, with the success categories? You have a, 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 an issue, a, a theme a, uh, with great success more than the others. I, I don't know, sports, uh, uh, war, and... I would say it's the diversity, right? I think it's a really, uh, people have such different tastes. So our job is to make sure that we're providing a really rich diversity of stories, both different points of view and different subjects. So it's really, it's surprising um, what people will uh, embrace and really watch. It's across the board. How do you choose your partners and storytellers? That's a great question. Um, 
So there are multiple ways that we come into our stories. So we're fortunate, we've been doing this a while, we have some pretty wonderful uh, relationships with filmmakers. So we certainly start there, right? So we go after some of the most preeminent filmmakers and we inquire with them, you know, what is the one subject that you're burning to talk about? You know, what's keeping you up at night? And we really want to understand what they're um, most passionate about. Because documentary filmmaking is hard. Right? It's, it requires a lot of rigor. It generally takes a lot of time. So we really want to um, know what somebody's very, very passionate about. Um, and so when we think about that, we look at subject um, and then also innovation of storytelling. Right? So what's really important is, does that particular filmmaker have a unique way to tell the story? So looking at something like uh, Making a Murderer as an example, which was our um, series that we released in December of 2015, what was unique was uh, these filmmakers had been working on this project for 10 years. So they uniquely embedded in this community in Manitowoc, Wisconsin. They were in all the courtrooms, right? They, they were able to um, acquire all of the interrogation footage that took place. And so what was distinct and highly unusual and very innovative in the filmmaking was no one was telling you what to think or feel. As a viewer, you were in the room and allowed to experience it and have a real response yourself. You were allowed to think critically and come up with your own conclusions. And I think that's why, in particular, this series, as an example, really exploded across social media because people needed to connect with other people and discuss it. Right, so the ability for particular filmmakers to have a unique vantage or a distinct level of access is incredibly exciting. Okay. How do you choose uh, which stories to tell? Um, well, I think it's the real cross-section for us of art and science. So we have the beauty of having a lot of data. So obviously starting in DVD, you know, 17 years ago, right? We have a lot of data around how people consume content. But that's a really great starting point. That's one data point. Um, and then we look at um, what is the, again, the unique angle to the story and who is the distinct storyteller who's going to actually um, tell it in a fresh new way. And the other thing is we have a tremendous amount of flexibility as a platform. We're very lucky in that we can sit with a storyteller and say, how do you believe your particular story is going to be best communicated, right? And we can say, is it a feature film? Is it a multi-episodic series? Is it a short? You know, in the case of White Helmets, as an example, um, the filmmakers, uh, uh, Orlando von Isadel and Joanna Natasagara, we had worked with them previously on a film called Virunga. Um, and so uh, we knew how incredibly gifted they were as filmmakers. And they came to us and said that they had distinct access to the White Helmets. And yet they felt that it was incredibly important to move quickly because of what was happening in the conflict. So we decided that what we would produce would be a documentary short. Because that would allow us to actually film more quickly, produce more quickly, and release it into the, into the world more quickly. So we're very fortunate that we have an incredible level of flexibility around form. Um, even something like Making a Murder, it's 10 episodes, but none of the episodes are the same length. They're all different, right? Because every chapter of the story required something a little bit different. And we have the flexibility to provide that to our story making uh, storytelling partners, right? So the story dictates the form, not a broadcast slot or a particular, you know, break you need to take for commercials. We don't do any of that. It's really about story first. Yeah. Let's talk about White Elements. You won an Oscar, uh, but what do you think? What are the key elements uh, uh, that lead to this award? Oh, that's a big question. Um, I mean, first and foremost, I like to believe that it has to be an incredible story. Um, and generally speaking, in the documentary category, I would say that they're really looking for um, films with impact, um, films that show um, you know, a, a unique way of producing. So in this particular case, because of the conflict, um, Western journalists were not permitted into Syria. It was considered to be extraordinarily dangerous. And so they came up with a very unique 
um, way of producing the film. So Joanna and Orlando traveled with the White Helmets out of Syria into Turkey where they were doing their training and so they captured that. And the White Helmets had already a young cinematographer who actually joined when he was 17, so he's 21 now, uh, who has been recording what the White Helmets have been doing. And so they trained with him, gave him a new camera, kind of gave him some new techniques. And so he actually went back into Aleppo with the White Helmets and captured all of the most visceral scenes of them entering into um, the rubble and you know, really um, in action. And so they were able to go back and forth and sort of film in separate locations and combine um, the footage in a really visceral way. Um, and I think that the, uh, you know, the Academy was very responsive to that. Um, you know, on top of that, I feel very fortunate uh, because Netflix has such a big commitment to documentary. We have a very substantial, dedicated team. Um, we have teams of people around the world and our various, you know, we have seven offices around the world. Um, but the documentary initiative has its own dedicated marketing team, publicity team, social team, awards team, um, because we recognize that it's really important to support the form uh, uniquely. So I think the fact that um, in conjunction, obviously, with the incredible um, filmmaking, I think that, you know, our teams were able to continue to keep the story in, in, the, uh, in the minds and hearts of people. You know that the, the topic of this panel is the, the, the idea of documentaries as a form of journalism. Mm -hmm. And what's your opinion? And what do you think, what are the differences and common points between documentaries and journalism? It's a hotly debated topic, yes. Um, I think it depends on the filmmaker, right? So um, for, for our part, you know, it begins with the selection of the filmmaking partner. Right, so we put a lot of time and energy into who we select to work with. Um, and ultimately, it, you know, we work with filmmakers that apply an incredible amount of rigor to their research, um, to their fact checking, um, you know, to tell a really balanced story. You know, an example is we worked with uh, the director Ava DuVernay on her documentary 13th, um, which really explores uh, the criminalization of people of color from the time of the abolishment of slavery in 1865 all the way through to 2017. She conducted what must have been almost 50 different interviews from both sides of the aisle, um, and she really wanted to sit with the smartest um, luminaries on the topic to better understand the different positions. And so again, this is a situation where the rigor has to be applied in creating the opportunity for the viewer to experience the material and multiple points of view and to make their own decision. Um, you know, but I think the, the key with documentary storytelling is it has to be compelling, right? You have to engage people. So there's a real craft to be able to um, engage on a very personal narrative in order to sort of expand uh, the viewer's world. And ideally, when it's working really well, viewers will have an experience into an environment that they otherwise would never have access to. Right. Do you think Netflix public and, and consumer in, in general are living documentaries as a, a different form uh, journalism and information? I think that we have, um, I think we have an opportunity because in today's world where the news cycle is so fast, right, and so many people are consuming their information only in 140 characters at a time, it's very difficult, I think, to gain context to what you're being fed in the headlines. Um, and I think documentary has a very um, important and exciting opportunity to take its time, right? So what we're able to do is to support the filmmakers, to give them the resources, and the resources are everything from the funding required to do the research, the time to conduct the fact checking and to go and to actually do the interviews that really allow for a balanced point of view, um, to tell more in-depth uh, stories and to provide people, because I think they're hungry for that. I think they're hungry for the context and sort of the history and the background of how we've arrived in many of these most complicated situations that we find ourselves in today. How many documentaries you released last year? 
Uh, last year was around 18, 18, 19. Okay. Yeah, and it's continuing to increase. N what's the future of documentaries for, for Netflix? Uh, we're very, um, you know, we're very ambitious about it. We've been uh, extremely pleased with uh, the sex success, both from the viewing perspective and the critical and um, awards-oriented um, measures. Um, and again, I think that uniquely, because we're able to connect these storytellers with such a global audience, and we're able to really um, see that it's bringing a lot of delight. I mean, that's the thing that I love the most, is when I, um, you know, we, we often conduct like a consumer insight survey, is when I get to sit in the room and hear from somebody that they'd never watched a documentary before. But because of the way it's presented on our service uniquely, um, they tried it, right? The barrier of entry to try, there is none. You can just hit, click play, right? And our algorithm hopefully is learning what your preferences are so we're matching really well for your mood and your tone of what you're looking for. And the notion that we are introducing a new form, a new genre to somebody is really exciting. And that sense of discovery is, I think, what people love the service for. Thank you, Lisa. Can you introduce us, uh, Nobody Speak, the documentary that we are going to, to watch tonight? Sure, I'm so excited that you're here to, to watch this film. Uh, the director, Brian Knappenberger, um, I think has done a really tremendous job. So the story started out as an examination of privacy rights versus free press. And it's told through the story in the lens of the Hulk Hogan case versus Gawker Media. But then it really evolved from being just about privacy versus free press when it became known that um, you know, individuals with incredible financial influence were actually funding uh, the legal case for Hulk Hogan. So that then uh, evolved the story to be more about not just privacy and free press, but what the threat is to free press when we're living in a day and an age where potentially individuals with great financial means can actually influence what's covered in the press. Um, and I can't imagine a time where that's more important than now or a better place to actually present the film. So I, I hope you enjoy it. Thank you. Thank you so much. Prima di vedere il documentario io mi faccio un micro spot perché domani sera se vi piacciono i documentari presentiamo qui alle 8 un documentario su, insieme alla, alla, alla mamma e al papà di, di Giulio Reggeni presentiamo un documentario nove giorni a, al Cairo eh, sono 52 minuti in cui ricostruiamo che cosa è successo. Grazie, buona serata. Grazie.